Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Dr. Downey, and today we are going to be talking about one of the worst psalms I've ever come across. And I'm going to give you my reasons for this in a second. This psalm goes by the name of AC262, or Acadrine, and I think it's become popular nowadays because it's touted as being fairly safe and mild in comparison to other psalms. Someone brought my attention to it the other day by asking me a question about it, and I hadn't really heard much about it before. That's because there are quite a few novel psalms being created these days, but I thought just due to its popularity I would make a video. And having done my research, I've come to the conclusion that not only is it not really a psalm, it's pointless to use and could potentially be harmful. The reason I say it's not a traditional psalm is because it seems to be a partial agonist at every androgen receptor that it interacts with, whereas in traditional psalms, such as osterine, in anabolic tissues like the muscle, they demonstrate full agonist ability. So essentially, it has the ability to stimulate anabolism as much as something like testosterone. However, they have partial agonist abilities in androgenic tissues like the prostate. And what this means is that in the presence of something like DHT, it actually works like a weak antagonist and antagonizes the effect of DHT on the prostate, which is why you'll see in these studies that Osterine in intact rats decreases the size of a prostate in comparison to control. However, in the case of castrated rats, it actually stimulates an increase in the prostate size in comparison to its castrated control. But what I'm essentially trying to get at here is that's the idea of selective receptor modulation. A drug has mixed agonistic and antagonistic abilities. But AC262, in one of its characterization studies, was demonstrated to act more like a partial agonist. This was demonstrated not only in the in vitro models used, but also the in vivo models used with rats. So remember, traditional SARMs should have full agonistic abilities on anabolic tissue. However, AC262, in comparison to testosterone, only had 67% of its full anabolic effect. This again would suggest it's a partial agonist. Not only that, but AC262 dose dependently inhibited DHT-induced proliferation of the prostate. So that's similar to traditional SARMs. However, its anabolic ability is not similar to traditional SARMs. Its anabolic ability is partially agonistic in nature. So then they did their in vivo study on AC262. And they compared various doses of 3 mg per kg per day up to 30 mg per kg per day. And they compared this not only to placebo, but to testosterone propionate at 1 mg per kg daily, or essentially 7 mg per kg of total testosterone a week. So the 3 mg per kg group was determined to be the ED50 of AC262. So essentially this is the dose required to reach 50% of the effects displayed by testosterone. And we can easily see that here by the Levita Annie being more or less half of the weight of that in the testosterone propionate group which is demonstrated by TP. And as we can see at that dose the suppressive effects on LH were not pronounced. When we look at a dose of 30 milligrams per kg, the effect achieved again represents that 66% of the maximum effect reached with testosterone, which was also demonstrated in the in vitro trial, again demonstrating that in in vivo models it still acts as a partial agonist. However, its only redeeming factor was that it had very weak effects on the prostate size and as the doses increase from 10 mg per kg to 30 mg, the prostate didn't really differ much in size and neither did the seminal vesicles demonstrated at the right. Unfortunately, this is pretty much the only data we have. There is one other trial, but we don't have any human trials. 
So we have to extrapolate this data. And if we were to extrapolate these results, it would demonstrate that a dose of 30 milligrams per kg a day is only 66% as anabolic as testosterone propionate at a one milligram per kg per day yet more suppressive and we can see that in the LH results. However, its redeeming factor again is the fact that it did not stimulate prostate growth as much as testosterone propionate did. If we were to convert these dosages into humans, you would use a conversion factor of about 5 to 6. So the testosterone propionate dose used per week is more or less 1 milligram per kg per week. And if we look at the AC262, the highest dose tested would be 5 to 6 milligrams per kg per day. Again, given the fact that the results kind of demonstrate a partial agonistic behavior of this drug, it would be illogical to use AC262 with any other full agonist. And the reason for this is that partial agonists in the presence of full agonists at higher doses can sometimes work like a weak antagonist, just as it does so in the prostate. And I'm just going off pharmacodynamics here, but essentially this would mean that if you were to use AC262 and it is a partial agonist, the AC262 would become more of a weak antagonist and you wouldn't get the same anabolic effect that you would from running testosterone alone, it would be lower. And I will demonstrate this by showing a few graphs. So essentially, you can only really use AC262 by itself, hypothetically. The only time this drug might be anabolic is if you were hypogonadal. But again, if you were to use the highest dose, you would probably, you would still only reach about 66% of the effect achieved by testosterone propionate. But in comparison to being hypogonadal, as demonstrated by the control in the study, using the AC262 was better than not producing testosterone, which isn't surprising. And again, like many of these new SARMs, there aren't human trials and you have to rely on others' experiences, which is quite difficult because there is no standardization of the supply of SARMs. You can't with 100% confidence say that you did take this SARM, so the side effects experience might be due to the fact that it wasn't actually AC262, or it actually might be the side effect. So it's very difficult to go off anecdotal reports. We haven't got a phase one trial to demonstrate how it acts in healthy young individuals, and therefore I cannot state that it is safe in healthy individuals because we don't have those phase one trials. So in conclusion, AC262 is more or less a partial agonist, its anabolic effects are weak, and the only time it might have anabolic abilities is if you were hypogonadal, but again that's just a hypothesis. And again, there aren't human trials so be careful when looking into these SARMs. In my next video, I'm going to look at other SARMs like ACP and try to characterize it in the same way I have done with AC262. But let me know what you think about this video, if you enjoyed it, if you didn't, if you disagree with me, and I will see you guys in the next video. So thank you for watching.